Salutations, generations, and welcome back to The Soundtrack Dude, a show about music from the silver screen to the stage and beyond. As you'll recall, my name is Chris, I drive a man van, and I love fall. As evidenced by Mind Bumpkin. Last we left off, we were establishing my rules and my categories and a little background on me, just basically giving a structure for the show. And as I mentioned last time, this episode will be covering important terminology. Here we go! First, we'll be covering the difference between the soundtrack and the score. This is a huge difference. Oh man, this used to annoy me. Which, in retrospect, is pretty mean and elitist of me. But it doesn't bother me anymore. Now I take it as a compliment. See, what used to annoy me was people would come up and tell me how much they loved the soundtrack, and I'd be ecstatic, and I'd start talking to them about it, and then they'd look at me funny and be like, uh, no, I'm talking about, like, you know, the music in the movie. And I was like, I'm talking about the music. And, and they'd tell me, obviously, they're referring to the lyrical, popular music that was used. Rats! So here's the difference. The score, sometimes called the underscore, is mostly instrumental music that is originally composed for the film. The soundtrack is a collection of popular music that influences the film and or is featured within it and it's sometimes called The Album. I know this is a little confusing with the title of my show because I will most likely be talking more about the score than the album, but there's a distinction. Here are three perfect examples of this concept. Boop, boop, boop. There you have it. The soundtrack, the album, which was tough on me as a child because I would be in the soundtrack section looking for the score and I'd always run across these. This isn't as big of an issue nowadays. Like you can find the score to films pretty pretty easily. But back when I was a kid looking for soundtracks, this was tough. See these are the scores. These are what I was looking for. I kid you not, for all three of these examples, I had to like hunt down the score. In fact, I even signed a petition to get Transformers. <laughs> they just like wouldn't release it. Shout out to Jordan Harms, that struggle was real! The cool thing is that oftentimes the album will feature a suite or two of selections from the original score. <laughs> what is a suite, you ask? Well, that's a good question. Oh, hello. Welcome back. I suppose you're here to hear about something sweet. Spelled like this, it is pronounced sweet. And it is sweeter than a lollipop. You see, a suite is a collection of works that can be played one after another. The pieces are typically dance movements. In the case of film scores, however, a suite can be used to conceptualize the feeling of a film. It introduces themes. It gives a glimpse of the tonal scope. That's right. Suite equals sample. Now when I talk about introducing themes, there's more you need to know. Over here we got leitmotif, and over here we have motif. What's the difference? These are a couple of our most important terms, and there is a clear distinction between the two, as similar as they are. So here we go. A light motif, spelled this way, but also spelled this way. This is a melodic theme associated with a specific character, place, idea, event, anything. It was originally introduced in the use of operas so that you could have a continuous idea of identity. Basically, a light motif is a reoccurring theme. Now, a motif, which is not much more different, <laughs> is a little more basic of a term. This is just a reoccurring or dominant element within the work. You can see the distinction. Broad, specific. The key to a leitmotif is being repeated throughout the work. It gets its root from the aforementioned other way of spelling the word German term leitmotiv. Leitmotiv. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Look it up. It's formed from the German word leiten, which means to move, and motiv, which is what it sounds like. Motive, which means leading motif. See? The leading motif. Sometimes this is even referred to as the guiding motif, as it is supposed to guide the audience through the work. 
it enables not only the composer but the audience to be able to relate to this work as a whole without the necessity of words. It just relates to the emotion. Whew. Richard Wagner was the first one to actually institute this method. Wait a minute. Richard Wagner. Richard. Richard Wagner? Hold on. Richard Wagner. Ah, I messed it up. <laughs> well, that, that's how you say it, okay? I'm just gonna call him Wagner. That's, that's it. Okay, he might not have been the first one to institute it. He's just the earliest known person who revolutionized this idea. His cycle of four operas, During Des Nibblegun. Oh, I'm gonna stop trying to pronounce these words. Wagner used hundreds of light motifs, often relating to specific characters and feelings. His work was revolutionary and it changed classical music. Although, in the case of soundtracks, we often refer to leitmotifs in a more simple term. You guessed it, we're talking about themes. The theme, usually, is a recognizable melody upon which part of all of the composition is based. This is where we get stuff like the main theme, the main titles, the thing you hear right when the film starts. You know, that thing you hum when you're walking out of the theater. See, the theme is highly synonymous with leitmotif. Heck, they're practically interchangeable. And like the leitmotif, themes can be very complex or very simple. It can be as small as, oh say, an object, or as grandiose as the entire essence of the whole film. Speaking of essence, tone. Tone is a musical or vocal sound with reference to its pitch, quality, and strength. But in the case of soundtracks, we are talking about a little bit different definition. It's the mood, it's the evolution of the voice of the story as it unfolds. Oh, hello again! <laughs> I suppose you want to hear about the next term, which is, of course, neoclassical music. But what is neoclassical music? Well, it's the combination of two important terms. There's neos, which is the Greek term for new, and then there's classicus, which is the Latin term for of highest rank. How does that relate to soundtracks, you might ask? Good question. You see, there are many incarnations of neoclassicism in regards to music. It's a 20th century movement. Basically, it's the new age of classical music. Now scram, there's more to learn. Programmatic music, also known as program music, and also alternatively spelled this way, is pretty cool. It's a type of music that attempts to personify extra musical narrative. A story being told can be interpreted by the audience or told to them via program notes. See, the idea is to invite imaginary imagery so that as the music plays, you begin to see something in your mind. More often than not, works of program music are driven by dominating motifs, or as they're also known, light motifs. Sound familiar? See, this all ties together. Taking it all the way back to classical music, Vivaldi's Four Seasons are a good example of programmatic music. As he tried to capture the mood of various elements in nature, he would adjust his music to try and fit that tone. The example here we'll be using is the second movement of Winter. Notice how the plucking of the strings are representative of the gentle dripping of rain. In contrast, we'll look at Chopin's Raindrop Prelude, which also attempts to personify rain. It has a similar effect, but also notice how the two pieces have wholly different tones. My favorite example of this is Gustav Holst. Pretty sure I'm saying his name right, but don't quote me. His work, The Planets, is another well-known example of programmatic music. A seven-movement orchestral suite by the English composer, each wonderful movement is unique to one another and represents a planet in our solar system. Each planet is paired with its corresponding astrological character as well. I could do a whole review just on the planets, but, you know, maybe I'll do that another time. This piece is called Ares, the bringer of war. Sounds pretty warlike, doesn't it? I'd say so. 
But I digress, there's one more example here that I need to cover. See, there's a long list of composers who have written program music, like Tchaikovsky, Ralph Vaughn Williams, Aaron Copland, and one of the best examples, Leroy Anderson. I'm going to play a short little piece of music for you, and I just want you to guess, before I tell you what the title is, what this music is trying to accomplish. Did you guess typewriter? Because you'd be correct! Yes, it's called the typewriter. You know how he got that sound? Well, he used an actual typewriter. Now, relating to soundtracks, program music has had a direct relation to its influence. Take John Williams, for example, the man who redefined soundtrack music. He was heavily inspired by Mr. Holst and has followed his programmatic model to this day. Thanks to composers like John Williams, program music has become a staple of the genre. Can you imagine what soundtracks would be like without programmatic music? It's a whole different world. All right, guys, I got one more turn for you. You're doing great. We're almost there. Our final turn for this video, trailer music. It's the background music used for a film's previews. The frustrating thing for people like me is it's not always from the film's soundtrack. I love trailer music. Heck, I collect it. See, the purpose of this music is to complement, support, and integrate the feeling of the movie. And there's a lot of ways to do it, and I get it. You gotta sell tickets, even if your movie's not good, so you gotta make the trailer look different. This is another example where I could beat up on Star Wars The Force Awakens, but I digress. I will talk about that later, as in, in a different video entirely. So there's a lot of different kinds of trailer music, like music from the score of other movies. That's cool. There's another movie that you want to use their music for in your trailer. I get it. That's cool. But don't pick a song that doesn't even sound remotely close to what your score ends up sounding like. What? Ooh, this is, this is becoming a rant. <laughs> then there's popular, well-known lyrical music. Cool. Fine. That's cool. There's classical music. You can almost never go wrong. Then there's specifically composed music, which is really neat. I always support that. Well, not always. Usually. And then, of course, there's library music. Ooh, boy. That's the good stuff. This is where we're talking about, like, Two Steps From Hell, immediate music, epic score, Joe Blankenberg, really slow motion. Oh, the list goes on and on. That's its own discussion. <laughs> but this stuff is great. Only problem is that sometimes a filmmaker will use library music like this and then totally sell a different film than the actual film that's coming out. It's <laughs> it drives me crazy! And I gotta stop there because I could keep talking about trailer music for hours, so I'm gonna cut it off here. As you can see, there's a lot of depth to this stuff. It's wonderfully complex and beautifully intricate. Soundtracks are the manufactured emotion of a film, detailing feelings that words simply fall short of describing. <laughs> I could go on and on about this stuff, but this is supposed to be a basic overview, so I'll leave it here. Guys, I am so excited to further this journey with you. It's going to be very interesting and hopefully also a lot of fun. Tune in next time for our first actual review. I will be reviewing The Last of the Mohicans. Thank you, my lovely soundtrackies, for once again tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have you. So until next time, keep listening with your eyes and seeing with your ears. Chris out. <laughs> <laughs>